evening good evening so glad to have you with us this evening and so we thank god for uh being with you this evening and what a great message that we have what does it mean to be christian and so we are looking at that now tonight what does it mean to be christian and so as we look at that we thank god for the opportunity to be there to be here together again Tuesday night. Thank you, God, for the miracle of technology. And um, I think we're, we're getting closer to starting back up in person on Tuesday nights for those that want that extra touch and fellowship. So I thank God for you bringing on our other platforms. Thank God for and um, so glad to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Lord God for uh, bringing us all together with us this evening. and so we are about to get started so welcome to covenant communities fellowship tuesday night study in god's word look it's so important for you to make sure that you are literally eating god's word eating the word of god um reading the word of god more and more and more that you are that you are filling yourself with god's word you know uh, in 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 you know one of the commandments that Christ gives is to learn of me that we are to learn more and more about God as he is revealed through you, through Jesus the Christ and so so excited about you being here us being here again together good evening good evening good evening so glad you are here bringing on a couple more pages couple more platforms and we will get started uh we'll give we'll give some uh others time to come on in right i tell you what if you have been listening then some of the things that i've taught have gotten in the way of our traditional beliefs but we cannot trade tradition for the righteousness of god there's so many people that are out there looking for God and, 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 and they are sincere in their pursuit, but oftentimes they are sincerely wrong. And so it's so important that people see us and, and as we are sharing our love for God, we don't choose one or the other. Our love for God, it penetrates every area of our lives be it business, be it government, be it service, our love of the most high God penetrates every area of our lives. And, and we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ at all, for it is the gospel that is the power by which men are saved. It is the miracle. The power of God is released into the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and so we are excited about that. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome to Covenant Community Fellowship. Mother Rice, so good to see you. So good to see you on. And uh, this is a day the Lord's made. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it. There, hey, Brother Humes, how are you, man? So glad to see you. Um, brother Paul, what an amazing name, my lady Trevor. So glad to see you. So glad that you're here and with us. Look, I'm challenging some concepts that are not true, right? I'm just going to tell you that things that we believe, even in trying to be good and trying to be right, they are just not true. The Church of God does not owe anybody an apology. The people who have put on the t-shirts and misrepresented the name of Jesus Christ in the earth, they owe us an apology, right? Uh, they owe all of us an apology. And so uh, there's no guilt and shame that we as Christians are supposed to carry with us because, you know, because... Um, because somebody did somebody wrong. And, and if you've been hurt in a church, then don't say, I will never let the church hurt me again, but I will never let that church hurt me again. If it's a relationship, I will never let that person in a relationship hurt me again. Now, as we become followers of the way, 
What does it mean to be Christian? And as others are coming, I'm just going to say this. Don't be confused by all the Hebrew Israelite stuff that is going on. Don't be confused. Jesus Christ did not come to get you to identify with an ethnicity or an ethnic group or a sub-ethnic group. That was not the reason why Jesus the Christ came. Jesus the Christ came that we might be restored to the most high God. That is the reason why he came. And so we don't let that go. Don't let people lead you to, uh, if you really want to be close to God, then you need to be a devout this or that or Baptist or Presbyterian or Catholic or whatever. I think Paul Zoll, who was the rector of the Advent Church many years ago, we we're standing on 21st Street. And he said this about the Episcopal faith, a very brilliant theologian of the Episcopal Church. He said, the Episcopal Church is not a slide that you get in, you get on, and you slide your way into heaven. No, the, the purpose of the congregational church is to assist and aid, and aid you in your spiritual formation, right? It is not the landing place. The church in itself is not the way to God, right? Jesus is the way to the most high God. And he has declared that in his word. Contrary to popular belief, the church is not our place of worship. The church is the place where we have corporate worship. But God never said to us that we are to worship one day a week. And so in our effort to do something that's right and intentional, sometimes we can get off because we as followers of the most high God are to worship God every day. And that word worship means to come forth and kiss. It is that there is to be an intimacy with God every day. And look, I know that throws some folks off, but I got to tell you right. It's tight, but it's right. It is the truth. We worship every day. And, and when we gather together on Sunday, on Sunday, for it is a day of corporate worship. That's what it is. It is a day of encouragement where we are edifying one another and we are sharing the gifts of the body of Christ. In fact, any gift that God has given you, it is not for you. It is for the body of Christ, for the edification of the saints in the work of the ministry. I tell you what, this is something. And somebody, you know, somebody asked me recently, what about the Sabbath? Well, the Bible says it makes it very clear that there were six days of creation. For six days he worked, and on the seventh day he rested. He didn't worship, he didn't sing, he didn't play songs, he didn't, he didn't do any of that, but it was a day of abstaining from the physical labor of the week. It was not supposed to come a super religious holiday where you, you had to do this that some man said because the Bible didn't say it, but it was acknowledging the fact. In fact, the Bible says this, that the Sabbath was made for the man, not the man for the Sabbath. We know that the Sabbath was not a day of, was not to be a the day of worship, but we were to worship God every single day of our lives. If we remove the religious confusion of us trying to identify with a denomination, with a, with a church structure, with, this, with these movements that pop up, the Hebrew Israelite, you got the Seventh-day Adventist, you got, you know, the Sabbath is the day of worship. No, the Bible doesn't say anything about the Sabbath day of worship. In fact, the Bible doesn't say anything at all about a mosque, a synagogue, or a church in the sense of building a church. In fact, for the, for the first 300 years of Christianity, the 300 years after Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, for the next 300 years, there were no church buildings built. There were no houses of worship built. 
That didn't come until 335 when the Catholic Church said, we're going to institutionalize the Christian belief. And they began to convert many of these pagan temples over to churches, church buildings. The synagogue was not a mandate from God either, nor the mosque. It was something that human beings had the liberty and freedom to do, to have a place of assembly, to have a place where we come together, to be strong together, to do the work of the Lord in supporting families and in reaching the community around us. So take a deep breath and relax. Exhale and enjoy the ride of walking with God. We've got, I believe, a really good Bible study tonight. What does it mean to be, to be Christian? Not a Christian, but what does it mean to be Christian in your ways? It means to be a follower of Christ's way to being restored to the Father. Wow. With Jesus Christ, there was a way in which he operated. There was a way in which he flowed. As my, my, my brother uh, Franco often said, you know, he was built different. That's what Franco said. He was built different, you know. Uh, he wasn't built like other folks. We built different. When we become a follower of the way, we are built different. In fact, uh, if, if you turn your Bibles to, to the book of Acts, because I, I want you to see this. In the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse, beginning verse 19 through 20, but well, verse 19 through 26. Book of Acts, verse 11, verse 19 through 26. I just want to show this to you. See, there, there was no Christian t-shirt or anything like that. There was a church in Antioch, and that talked about the body of believers that were in this geographical area. And here's what it said. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out <clears throat> when, when the deacon, Stephen, <clears throat> was killed, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. So some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch <clears throat> and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus so the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed, and they turned their lives over to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came, he saw the grace of God. He was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> and of faith, and a great man, and speaking of Barnabas, and a great man, many people were added to the Lord. Interesting. They were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he, found, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch to see the work. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Those Christians, <clears throat> the Lord's followers were first called Christians, it says. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, they were called Christians not because they belonged to First Baptist, Third Baptist, Second Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostal, Catholic Church. Oh, no. It was because they were Christian in their ways. 
there was something about them that when the people looked at them, they said that they are like Christ, which is literally what the IAN means, that they were like Christ, that there was something different about them. They were operating a different way. <clears throat> These were good men, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith, that is to say, reliance upon God, right? And the people noticed that there was something different about them. They said, what is this aroma? And they first called them Christians in the city of Antioch. I thought that was very, very interesting. So what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? To say that you are a follower of Christ, it means that you are amongst two thirds of the world's population that bleed, that Jesus taught us the way to the Father. That the life of Jesus, the examples of Jesus, the the role of Jesus as the Messiah is believed by two-thirds of the adults that are in the world. It is the foundation of the Christian faith, and it is the foundation of the Muslim faith that Jesus Christ showed us and taught us and demonstrated to us how to walk upright as righteous, godly men and turn all of us back towards walking upright before God. If you are Christian, you believe that. If you are Christian or if you are Muslim, you believe that. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? It is to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. In the Americas, we call him Jesus, the Americas. So America is North, Central, and South America. That is what America is, the continent. We call him Jesus. And the continent of America is the most Christian continent in the world. These 53, 54 countries that make up America, the continent of America, are the most Christian continent in the whole world. It's pretty amazing. We call him Jesus. If you are uh, if you are Muslim, then you would know his name when you read the Quran as Isa, I-S-A. You would see it there. If you are of the Hebrew world, you would call him Yeshua. But if you were of the time of, of Jesus the Christ in the day that he lived, you would call his name Esho. His Jesus, his followers, his mother, his father, brothers and sisters, they didn't communicate in Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic. His name was Esho. Right. So take the pressure off of you again when people come and start attacking you, talking about there is no J in the Hebrew language, and they want you to say his name right. Yeshua, who lived in Jerusalem, whose brother was James, and his disciples were John and James, and, and they're okay with using the J everywhere else, except for the religious bondage of trying to make everyone say Yeshua, Yeshua. Praise be to Yeshua, when even his mama didn't call him that. She called him Esho. And I'm not saying that we now have to have an Esho movement. I'm just saying, let's take some of the pressure off and enjoy the journey in walking with God. Jesus Christ had a mission. Two and three adults acknowledged that Jesus, the was the Christ, that he was the Messiah, most times the title given to Jesus in the Bible. Most times the title given to Jesus in the Quran is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. 
He is believed to be uh, have a born of a Virgin Mary. If you say that you are Christian and Muslim, you believe that that Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary. That his life manifested miracles that others would follow the way back to God. What does it mean to be Christian? Ironically, it means that we believe that Jesus is coming again to deal with the false prophet, the Antichrist, to judge the world and to set up his kingdom here on earth. That is part of what it means to be Christian. But amazingly, what it is that we believe, the Muslim believe the same thing, that Jesus Christ is coming again to save the world and to establish God's kingdom. As Christian, we believe that there is something more. We believe that Jesus is not just a good man and that Jesus is not uh, just a good prophet and Jesus is not just, uh, you know, a, a spiritualist or, or all of those things. We believe that he was the son of the living God. That when he was born, he was built differently. See, it's, it's hard to, it's, it, see, we accept the fact, just like Islam does, right? Just like the Quran does. The Quran accepts the fact that Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary, without a doubt. That the Virgin Mary was, was set apart. That she journeyed up into her cousin uh, Elizabeth's house. And that she was there with, the, with Zechariah, just as the Bible says. We believe that, and that John the Baptist was the forerunner who cried out, and John the Baptist is also mentioned in the Quran. I'm telling you, there's something about this Jesus that he is so well mentioned in the world's two largest religions or religious belief systems. He's so well mentioned that the majority of adults on earth identify with this man who was crucified at the age of 33 years, whose gospel ministry was a three year period, and who's now his, he is renowned across the entire globe from a three year ministry. That is pretty powerful. And you have to deal with the fact that the majority of people believe that he was born of the will of God, of the spirit of God, initiated by God, just as it is if you desire to be born again. As a Christian, it must be by the Spirit of God. So all this foolishness that you hear these people that read a book or came up with a theory that, that uh, the white slave masters on a boat made, Christian, made African people become Christians, that's not how it happens. It's never been claimed that you can be made to be a Christian. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter three, you must be born again. Not you were born once of the water, the water broke with your mother and then you came forth. You were born of the flesh. But to be a follower of the most high God, you must be born of his spirit as Jesus was born of the spirit of God. As Isai, as Esho, as Yeshua, whatever name you wanna give him, he was born of the spirit of God and not 
of the flesh of man. If you are Christian, that's why we believe that Jesus was built differently, that in him was the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. He gave his only begotten son. Jesus was begotten by the Father. God. And so we believe that. Now, not the Quran, but Islam rejects that portion of it, not the Quran, because when you began to reverse engineer, if Jesus was born of the spirit of God, then he was truly the son of God and Emmanuel, God with us because he was born of his father. See, when you start looking and you begin to read, you see that there's something more that's there. When the Quran was written, this was about uh, the first 300 years I taught, we talk about with the church. We're going somewhere. We're going to go to John chapter 14, uh, verses one through seven. That will be where we turn to next, because I want you to understand who, who Jesus says that he was. If you are a Christian, that means that you are a follower of the way, that you believe what Jesus taught that he is who he says he is, that he has done what, he, what it was prophesied that he would do, that he was sent of the Father to die on a cross for our sins so that the debt and the gulf between you and God, me and God, all of us in God can be closed if we trust in him as the bridge going across. I talk a lot about all the other parts because I want you to know something that this that the, this person Jesus the Christ the Messiah had such an impact on the world in a three year period of time from the age of twenty nine to the age of thirty three. Could you imagine that having that big of an impact? On the whole world. two out of every three adults says that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. But the religion will not allow them because I believe of what happened from the year 335 when, the, when, when Christianity became institutionalized and man became in and began to corrupt it, then that's when Islam was founded in the 500s and the Quran was written. And and it was in a rebuttal of what was happening in these churches that had been built for 200 years in these structures to where the structure is elevated up to the level of God. And Islam unites and pushes Christianity out of Asia, and then they turn and push it out of Africa as far as they can, but they can't push it out of Ethiopia. The first nation in the world to declare Christianity. The Moors come out of Africa and they go into southern Spain, I mean southern Europe, southwestern Europe. And they occupy Portugal and Spain and all those areas for over 700 years until the time of the Crusades and the Moors are pushed back across the peninsula. And Queen Isabella is now on the bloodline of, of, the, of the former kings 700 years later. Christopher Columbus going looking for wealth is looking for India to go and bring wealth back to Spain when after they were no longer occupied. This Christian faith spread across the world. But who is this Jesus? 
who does Jesus say that he is? So if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Let me put that up there. Okay, let me see how I get it. I think I'm still in Acts. There we go. Boom, there we go. So John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Jesus is, keeps telling them that he's going to go away. So Jesus, in these three-year periods of his ministry, he has his disciples. He has the three that were close, the 12, the disciples, and then he has the 72. Many more men and women followed him, right? So here's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God believe also in me. And then he does this thing that is so penetrating for his time. He doesn't call God, refer to God as Yahweh or by one of his titles, you know, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shiloh, the God of peace. He doesn't call him by one of those titles referring to what God has done. He refers to Yahweh in a more personal relationship that was challenging to the people of his day, to the Jews of his day. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms many mansions, the King James says, right? Right? And, 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 and now everybody, I got my mansion in glory. Uh, you know, hallelujah, I believe I got my mansion in glory. I've got a mansion waiting in glory and it's mine, oh Lord, it's mine. But the word mansion, because in the day, they were rooms, they were added on to the house for the son and his new bride. That's why he says in verse two, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I wouldn't have told you that if it were not so. And then he says this, verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Now, I want to stop right here. Jesus, often in his teaching, he took the, he took the known to give light to the unknown, so he compared it to uh, the betrothal, to the engagement of what happens in Jewish custom with marriage and the like. And so that's why he says this. I go away to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. This, and so when the Jews are hearing this, then they have the cultural context to understand this is beautiful. And so when you look at Jesus as being the groom and the church as the bride, he's telling a marriage story. And so what would happen in within the culture, the young men would, would propose marriage to the young lady. And, and so what he would do is um, he would leave her in the upper room on the second floor in what they call the bridal chamber. And in the bridal chamber, there were attendants in the bridal chamber to cleanse her, to wash her, to perfume her to present her to her husband when he returned without a spot or wrinkle. I want you to catch that, without a spot or wrinkle. So while she was being prepared for her wedding and her honeymoon, the son would go away to the father's house to prepare a place for her. And he would add on, build out a place, make room for his bride in the father's house. And the father would stand over it and he would look at it and he says, no, put that in place, put that in place. Okay, this looks good. Yeah, oh, no, 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 this isn't ready yet. The father would make sure that the son was ready to receive his bride and that all things were in place. 
And when, and when the father was pleased that the son had fulfilled what was necessary for his bride to come live with him, he would send him to go get his bride. And so, and, and so with the Jewish ceremony, the, the groom would go to get his bride and he'd have his best men with him, his brothers. And they're coming down and they're beating drums and cymbals. They're making all kind of a noise, you, you know, all of this loud noise, right? And, and then they're coming and, and they're about to do a mock kidnapping as a part of this. This is where you get eloping from. And they would come and they would put a ladder up against that, up against that house. They get to the second room and, and the groom would go up the ladder to get the bride that had been prepared for him. And they would elope. They would go from there to the place where he had prepared for them. This was symbolism that Jesus tells his beloved bride, the church, that although I go away, I'm coming back again because I'm going away to prepare a place in glory for you, to prepare a place where we can be together with God forever. And although I go, I promise you, I'm going to come back. But while I'm gone, I'm leaving you in the bridal chamber. If, if we were going to call the church anything, it's not the house of God, right? We know that. Because God said, my spirit will not dwell in temples that are made by the hands of men in that sense, right? That, that know ye not that your body is now the temple of God. So if, if we're gonna call the church anything, let, let's not call it the temple of God because it's not the temple of God. God's spirit dwells within us. But the church is really the bridal chamber to where we are supposed to be washing her, the bride, with the word of God, that we are to be equipping her so that we can present her faultless upon the coming of the Lord. The church is really supposed to be that bridal chamber that helps to prepare the bride of Christ to be presented without spot or wrinkle. And so when you say, well, with the trumpet will sound and, and the dead in Christ will rise and all those that will remain will be caught up to meet him in the air. It is the story of the groom coming back to carry us away to the place that he has prepared. People call that the rapture, the uh, eloping of the church, right? It's a beautiful story. Then he says this right here, while we are all in the, 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 the poetic verse of the story and how wonderful and, and how beautiful it is, hidden in the story is verse six and seven. In verse five, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Verse four, I'm going back. And you know the way to where I am going. I want you to catch this. And you know the way to where I am going. You know the person is going to get you to hook up to get into the concert. You know the person that's going to get you in to the presidential whatever, you know the way. He says to him and to his disciples, and you know the way to where I am going. See, because he's going to be with the father, right? Now you understand verse seven, excuse me, verse six. He says, this is Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is telling you 
who he is. He's telling you why he's here. He's telling you why, where he is going. He's telling you what his role is for you to be where he's going. He says, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also, that the groom is going to marry the bride, the church, and that we are going to go to the Father. Verse 4, he says, you know the way to where I am going. You know the way. Thomas said, how can we know the way? Verse six, I am the way and you know me. I just told you, you know the way, I am the way. I'm the connect. I'm the hookup. I'm hitch. I'm gonna connect you to the father. I'm gonna take you to the father's house. If you are Christian, that we are followers of the way, which is Jesus Christ. I am the way. Jesus is the way. We are followers of Jesus. Jesus is the way. The way is Jesus. Jesus is the way. The way is Jesus. Verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus answered, without me, no one can go to the Father. And if you had really known me, you would have known the Father. What do you mean? If you had really known me, relied upon me, you would have known the Father. If you got on the number 23 bus or the number 24 train, if you had known the train, relied upon the train, you would have ended up in the destination. And he's saying, if you had really known me, you would have known the father. But from now on, you do know him and you have seen him because Christ is reflecting the image of the father in the earth. See, you messed around and relied upon me. So from now on, because you trusted in me, because you got on this train, the passion of the Christ, the life of Jesus the Christ. I'm not going to lead you anywhere else except to the Father. That if you came to Jesus, that the purpose was that you might be restored and reunited with the Father. Not that you would ride on the train forever. Christ has declared, I am the way. No one comes through to the Father except through me, via me, by me. It's for this that I was created. A body had thou prepared for me. Man, if you are, if you are a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ declares that he is the way. So the early believers were called followers of the way. The way to where? The Father. It's such a beautiful thing. Now, I want you to know something, and I want you to see this because I think that it's very, very important. And I want you to see, I want you to see why this is so important, right? It is this message right here. This is the thing that the enemy wants to vanquish, that he wants to destroy, right? He doesn't want you to follow Jesus to the Father. You can do this religious thing all, all day long. You can have the t-shirts, you can have you can have the car tags, you can have all of that, but do not follow Jesus to the Father. 
don't make the connection. And we're going to see this right here. I want you to see this. This is in the Acts of the Apostle written by St. Luke. Acts chapter 4. So when you see the word Acts, it means Acts of the Apostles, written by Luke the physician, the Acts of the Apostles. Now, Peter and John have been brought in before the temple, before the church police. The uh, In that day, they had been brought in before the synagogues leadership verse four and so the apop the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the sadducees came up to peter and john while they were out speaking to the people they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people proclaiming in jesus the resurrection of the dead right proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. I want you to understand something, that they were not just proclaiming the resurrection of the dead, but in Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. See, the message that is so offensive to the Jew is that Jesus is the Messiah. That he, that he will rise again, that he has risen again. And when they saw that, they didn't, they didn't persecute them because they fed the hungry, that they tended to the poor, that they did all these works, gospel deeds of love, justice, and mercy. They, they, they persecuted them because of the message Let's keep reading verse three. So they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in the jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. See, it was this message. It wasn't whether they worshiped on, whether they went to church on Sunday, whether the Sabbath was the sixth day or the seventh day or the first day. It wasn't the day that they were esteeming it was the message that the Jewish leaders could not deal with. The next day, the rulers, verse five, the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem and Annas, the high priest was there. And so was Caiaphas and John Alexander, John and Alexander and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or by what name did you do this? We already know the answer, but we're going we're to we're gonna, we're gonna pretend like you didn't know any better. So we're going to give you a chance to make the correction that your power, your authority is not coming from the person of who Jesus is. Verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, told the nation's leaders and the elders, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become now the chief cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. They weren't confused that the problem was not the ministry. The problem was the message. The disciples were not eventually crucified 
because of the ministry, the good works. In fact, the Romans allowed them to, to exist among them because they, they not only care for the poor and the hurting among them, they took care of all the poor in the city of Rome. But there's something about this name, Jesus. See, being a follower of him isn't being, is, is not the same as being a Christian, a Baptist, a Methodist, a Catholic, or whatever. Oh, no. Being a follower of him, it testifies of the person of Jesus the Christ, that he was come down from the Father, that he is the firstborn of many, that he is fully God and fully man, that he has risen from the dead, and that there's no other name under, under heaven by which men must be saved. Your works aren't going to save you. Your giving is not going to save you. Your tithing is not going to save you. Your serving the poor and the hurting is not going to save you. It is at the name of Jesus. This was huge, guys. This was huge. The officials, verse 13, were amazed to see how brave Peter and John were, and they knew that these two apostles were, were only ordinary men and not well educated. And the officials were certain that these men had been with Jesus. Wow. That they were Christian because they were like Christ. Because they realized that they were unschooled, that they were not extraordinary men, but the presence of the Holy Spirit in them made them extraordinary. And it caused these officials and doctors of the law to be astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Verse 14, but since they could not see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered men, them, to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, go ahead and leave this temple, leave out of this place, and then they conferred together. See, now they're conferring not about the works. They didn't have a problem with the man being healed. It is by what authority that they did it by. It is proclaiming that Jesus is the source of that authority. Verse 16, they ask the question, what are we going to do with these men, they ask. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading, and further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. I like to see you be in the middle here, but to keep this thing from spreading, we will warn them never again to speak to anyone about the name of Jesus. So they called the, the two apostles back in and told them they must never for any reason teach anything about the name of Jesus. Now, I want you to hear this, not about the historical Jesus. Yes, the Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary. He was born in this town. He traveled here. At this. So they don't have a problem with you teaching the history. But the name of Jesus is more of a title that encompasses the life, the presence, the power, and the preeminence of a name that is now above all names.
They will let you do your religious stuff. They'll let you stand on the street corner and holler with a microphone. They'll, they'll let you say, well, hey, we are Hebrew and teach mainly out of the Old Testament because they never have to worry about the name of Jesus. Ain't nobody going to bother you. The Christians aren't going to, the, the Jews aren't going to bother you. The Muslim ain't going to bother you. The Hare Krishna aren't going to, the Buddhists ain't going to bother you. It's what you are teaching about the name of Jesus, what you are ascribing to the name of Jesus. This is the problem. And people will give you a pass on your bad behavior as long. You must never, for any reason, teach anything about the name of Jesus. It has to do with an authority of having the right and power and granting you an authority to operate on a level that exceeds and doesn't need our permission. And if we let you operate like this, people are watching you, and this thing is going to spread all over every place. So to keep this thing from spreading, you can still do your ministry. You can still have your prayer breakfast. You can still, you can still uh, hoop on Sunday. And if it makes you feel better, you can hoop on Saturday too. but it's this name of Jesus. Peter and John verse 19 answered, do you think God wants us to obey you or to obey him? We cannot keep quiet about what we have seen and heard from Jesus. Wow, verse 21, 22. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. He had been lame for a long time. Everybody knew him. It was a miracle that came from God. And you see that they were praising God. They said that the power for the healing came through the name of Jesus. And them saying that did not diminish who God was and God getting all the glory. Just about through right here. As soon as Peter and John had been set free, they went back and told the others everything the chief priests and the leaders had said to them. And when the, and when the rest of the Lord's followers heard this, they praised they prayed together and said, Master, you created heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. And by the Holy Spirit, you spoke to our, to our ancestor, David. He was your servant. And you told him to say, why are all the Gentiles so furious? Why do people make foolish plans? The kings of the earth prepare for war and the rulers join together against the Lord and his Messiah. Now, here in Jerusalem, Herod and Pontius Pilate got together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Then they turned against our holy servant, Jesus, your chosen Messiah. They did what you in your power and wisdom had already decided, preordained would happen. Lord, listen to their threats. We are your servants. So make us brave enough to speak your message, not to do your good works, not to feed the hungry, not to give water to the thirsty, not to do all of these things. That's the ministry. But the ministry can never compromise the message. The methodology that you use can never compromise the message for the power is in the message. So they're praying, verse 30. So Lord, show your mighty power as we heal people and work people and want and do wonders in the message name of your holy servant, Jesus. 
you pray to God in the name of your servant Jesus. And they had prayer and they had prayed. The meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and boldly spoke God's message. I wanted you to see this right here. Don't ever be confused. If you are Christian, a Christian, it means that you are following the ways of Christ, for he is the way, being returned to the Father. This is so powerful and it's so exciting. I love it. I love it. I love it. Never forget it's the message. Don't compromise the message. Shut down the ministry, but don't ever shut down the message. Shut down the methodologies and the strategies, but don't ever surrender the message. Jesus was crucified on the cross, not for what he had done, but because he would not deny who he was and who he is. There is power in the name of Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, they asked the disciples, what meaneth this? We understand in our own language. What is this new thing that is happening? What is this great move that is happening? And, and here's what the apostle said, that same Jesus whom you crucified, has been raised, has ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. That same Jesus has given us the power to live for God. Y'all, I thank God for you. What a, what a perfect, powerful message. The power is in the message of who Jesus Christ is. The things that you've seen and heard, commit thou to a few faithful men and women and make disciples. Go ye unto all the world, all the nations, all the ethnicities, and teach them my teachings and to observe my ways. Teach them to do that. That's what he says. Teach them. The things, these things that I've taught you, these things that you have seen, these things that you have heard, teach them to observe all of these things that I have taught you and make them disciples, followers of the way in being restored to Father God. You all, this is so powerful. It is the message. Never compromise the message. That same Jesus. It's not, oh, well, you know, my ministry is blessed. No, that same Jesus who was raised from the dead is yet able to raise your marriage from the dead, to raise the dead situations of your life, to put life back into your body, to let healing spring forth like the noonday to put strength back in your feeble members to where to where the locusts and the canker worm have eaten to restore all of that in more what was taken in battle and what was taken unlawful god says i will restore to you all of that and more that same Jesus, the messages in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. At the name of Jesus, he will return the hearts of the sons and daughters back into the fathers and mothers. He will say to the West to give up and to the East, hold not back. God will restore your family. He will restore your provision. if you will receive and embrace the message of Christ, his cross, and his crown. Look, we love you. 
God bless you. God keep you. I love God's word. If you get a chance, listen to this again. If you think you can bless somebody, share it with them. And as you think about this, three things. What are the things you're going to do differently immediately? Because this word is true. What are the, secondly, what are the things you're going to begin to change to align yourself up with the message of Christ? And then third, what are the things that you're going to teach to make sure that it's with your family and that the word of God goes throughout all that you touch? God loves you. So do we. Covenant Community Fellowship, we love you guys so much. We thank you for the opportunity to share God's word. You all make it possible for us to share God's word. Our God is awesome. His church is amazing. It is filled with people that are in the transformative process. Like a hospital is filled, hospital is filled with people that are, that are needing to be restored. So his church is filled with people that also need to be spiritually restored. And God has promised that he that has began a good faith in you will be a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You can get there from here, from trusting in God, trusting that he sent his son, Jesus the Christ, to pay a debt that you could not pay, pay by dying a death that you could not die. God loves you so much. When you were at your worst, he loved you. How's, how's he going to be turned off by you now? When you have made steps towards him. It's a beautiful thing. God love you. We'll see you Sunday morning, 930. God bless you. And keep you and your family. Take care.